right, the final panel, you guys made it till the end. Huh? Give yourselves a hand. Hey, Don, how you doing? All of our speakers, I'm super excited for this panel. Um, so first up, we've got John Turo. He's a partner at Madrona. Give it up for John. Up next, we've got Sheila Gulati, Managing Director at Tola Capital. Can I put the mic in there? All right. Up next, we got Yuval Neiman, Managing Director at Trilogy Equity Partners. So, we get those? Or and like they, Avril they, Ginsberg, General Partner at Founders Co op. Yeah. And lastly, we've got Joaquin Gallardo with SVB, who's been a great supporter with this event. And so, we're going to give him like. No, they gave me this thing here. Oh, and then kick off the so, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. I promise I'll keep it under two minutes. It's pretty boring. So, my name is Joaquin Gallardo, and it's an absolute privilege to be here. I am ridiculously excited about AI, because right now, it, when the iPhone came out, it kind of sparked this whole mobility investing thing, which lasted for the better part of a decade, and when ChatGPT came out, it's the, it's the same thing. So, the prior panel was about the gold rush, and now we're, we're all in it again. So we've got this panel here, we both need and our photos. <laughs> we all do AI investing. And I've got a bunch of questions for them. And I'm sure you guys got a lot of questions as well. So we're going to keep this interactive and fun, and it'll be a blast. So feel free to follow up. The magic is always in the follow-up questions. So I'll do the best to kick it off. And then from there, we should just dive into a conversation. So I'll kick it off with Abiel, and could we all go down, introduce yourselves, your fund, and what the most interesting, latest investment you have is. Okay. And, uh, so I'm Abiel Ginsberg, general partner at Founders Co-op. Um, we've been around for about 16 years now, the N1 partner, currently investing out of a $50 million fund into companies based in the Pacific Northwest. The vast majority of our investments are in B2B software companies, vertical SaaS, cloud infrastructure. Um, and I don't want to say AI because all the companies have some version of AI these days in the way that all companies used to have databases in them. That's generally what we invest in. Um, you asked this question last night about what were the most recent, and I'm realizing that the five most recent investments that I've done are not announced, and apparently that feels like a really new trend with AI because nobody really wants anyone to know what anyone else is working on. Um, so I'll just say that the most recent investment that I've made is in a company whose name I won't say, but who are shocker uh, building on top of large language models and trying to abstract that away so that you can just manage a compliance document and not have to worry about the prompts in terms of what the model will do. So um, can you hear me? I guess we ran out of speakers. Um, so I'm Yuval Neiman. Uh, I've been with Trilogy for 15 years. Uh, we invest in early stage um, typically lead seed uh, rounds in uh, companies here, primarily in the Seattle area. Uh, we don't invest in AI. We invest in fantastic founders, and they do what they do. Um, so that's kind of what we do. And just to prove my point, actually, the, less, the latest investment that is public that I've made is in a company that is not doing AI. They're doing, it's, it's, a, it's a company called Zuplo, and they're doing, it's a modern implementation of API gateway, um, you know, to put Kong and Apigee and all those things to kind of to bed. And um, so, uh, but we, we see a lot of companies who are using AI in many different interesting ways. Sheila Gulati, I started Tola Capital over a decade ago. We're investing out of our fourth fund. Uh, of two to 30 million bucks. We invest early. We are all ex-operators from an enterprise software perspective. So we like to get involved with our companies. We like to be hands-on and helpful. And uh, I'm in the non-announcement trend, but I did a deal that totally transformed my own productivity. And so I am strangely more productive right now. Uh, and we'll announce the deal, I think, in the fall for some reason. But it's interesting because they're trying to bring together that, how do I have an agentic help to me, but how do, how do I have agentic help to kind of all of us together to plan this panel or to do some other element, and it has totally transformed how I work, so I'm pretty psyched right now. Well, well hi folks, here's John Turo, I'm a partner with Drona. We're early stage investors, we write checks anywhere from the first check through series 
see or so. Uh, gosh, a lot of AI happening, gosh, a lot of it's not getting announced. There's a recent company that we did announce, um, which is called Barrier Bio. We invested in them, and what Barrier Bio does is they use LLMs to design proteins, and the proteins deliver drugs from the bloodstream through to various organs to make it easier to get them in so you don't need to inject into somebody's spine or something like that. Uh, really powerful stuff. And so that's a recent investment that we've announced in, uh, in the drug. All right, so it seems we have valuations. So as the graduation rates have been kind of falling from C to A, how are you guys thinking about how that all plays together um, in your investments? Um, you just have to bet on awesome founders. There's going to be mortality, there's going to be pivots. There's going to be combinations as well that I think are, can be super helpful for both companies. There's going to be all these things and, um, you know, I was at Amazon for a long time. Jeff likes, Jeff likes to say that people ask him what's going to change about the future and who knows. But he does know that certain things will stay the same. And so great founders and great talent and great vision will stay the same. That's what you can see. That's what we try to bet on. Speaking of things that are the same and different, I think one of the challenges is that the, the terms no longer mean anything. What is a pre-seed? What's a seed? What's an A? Uh, I had I saw a twenty-five million dollar seed, which I actually chipped into because I like the founder. It's not a core investment, but you back a founder you backed in the past. Um, and I've had a same conversation with other founders where it's a one and a half million dollar seed. And I think the reality right is just different businesses need to be capitalized in different ways. Different founders can command different valuations because they're going to build their company different. There isn't one way to build a company. But I think when you try to just do an apples to apples comparison across all these. That's where the confusion lies. But all that being said, I think people do take advantage of hype around this where you will sometimes see founders come in and be like, we just started out and we're raising on a $40 million valuation because that AI company is doing the exact same thing and that's what's market. Um, but all smart investors will just tell you, no, um, that's, <laughs> that's dumb. And so I think that's the onus on us is to invest in great founders um, despite the valuation. But the reality, right, is usually if it's a horribly mispriced raise, it's not a great founder, and from what you've heard from us, we're not investing anyway. So, so let me double click on that then. So if you have a, a new founder, how do you first bet that that's someone you want to talk to and that's someone you want to invest in? You don't, given no prior history. So we're hypothesis pivoted. So often what we're looking for, we've sort of defined a set of focus areas that we care about. And we then are trying to find everyone who's building in that space, be it academics, be it startups, be it what's the large company plays in those spaces. And so there's sort of two ways that we get deals. We go to uh, people that are around a certain hypothesis that we care about. And then we also, of course, take opportunistic conversations and opportunistic meetings with founders where we're like, That's, that should have been a hypothesis. That's an amazing area. That's a great area of focus and of opportunity. And I think, so. but for us, the vetting process starts with the problem space that the person is working in and the problem space that the person is working on. And then obviously very quickly pivots to, oh my God, is this a founder that we want to back? I don't think you have a mic. It's okay. You guys are doing a great job. <laughs> I just realized. Um, it, you know, I, I think like in a first meeting, it's like I try to come in as much as a blank slate as I, as late as I can, and then I'm looking for something that surprises me, some some spark and some some great idea. But it's mostly to to see how the person thinks and their energy and just how they tell a story. Obviously, is really important. Um, but just like to just kind of double click on what. Um, Aviel said, you know, every company we invest is different. Every time the valuation discussion is different, you know, they're all unique and different. And so it's the same with, with a, you know, what leads from a first meeting to a second meeting, from a second meeting to a third meeting. There isn't, I would say, a common pattern. Every time it's a different journey would be my experience. Yeah, and I think maybe we could to, to bookend because I think you're in the middle and then I'm on the opposite end of, of Sheila where we have only, out of five funds, made one investment where it was a cold outbound 
and one investment where it was a cold inbound. Both of those failed. Every other investment we've made has been a referral by a referrer who is a known quantity that is, is that we can very quickly triangulate and build trust um, and, and, and go that way. So I, I know that sounds weird where it's like, yeah, we're open for business, but if you can't find a path to us, we're not gonna invest in you. But part of the way that our thesis works is our network is the way that we diligence and the way that you diligence the space based off of hypothesis. I think so much, so much has been said that I agree with. I guess I would add only two points. There is a concept of founder market fit that really matters. Uh, you can hear it in somebody's voice when they're talking about a space that they know, they say, you know, gosh, in my career, I've really only been doing X thing, and this is another iteration of X thing, or here's a connection to X thing. That turns out to matter. Another a heuristic, uh, kind of to Yuval's point that I use is, does something surprise me? Is there a spark? Do I learn something that I, I wouldn't have expected during that first half an hour or hour or however long that it is we get to spend together? Those are a couple things that I'm that I'm listening for that, that kind of help me figure out whether it makes sense to dig in for it. All right. So as it relates to AI, everything seems to be new, seems to be changing, and unannounced. So to, <laughs> so to that end, how do you dive into an idea or a product that you would like to invest into, but then evaluate whether it has longevity to it, that it's not going to be, that it's going to stay relevant. Well, maybe I'll take, you know, a, a year ago, every startup you know, would come in and say, oh, we're doing AI, and like, what does it mean to do AI? You know, you, you must be trying to solve a problem, especially if we're talking in the context of enterprise, right? Um, and so, I think today, I, I mean, kind of the way I look at it more and more is like, okay, what problem can you solve with AI that is really valuable that you couldn't solve before, right? That's kind of, that's the key question. And, and I think it's often, you know, some, some interesting vertical in the enterprise. And my sense is, and kind of, I, I can't say that I have had enough points to kind of really uh, quantify this, but in a sense, you need to have more domain expertise than maybe you, you had you need before when you built SaaS. When when SaaS was coming around a decade ago, it seems like any you know twenty year old could start a SaaS company and go solve a problem that has been you know kind of neglected for decades. Um, but there are fewer neglected places. SaaS has already covered you know so many of the verticals. So now you really have to be way better than what's there before, um, and so. I do think that there is, my, my sense is you need to have more domain expertise than you had before in terms of how do you apply AI, what data, you know, and, and the, you know, the, the, the oil for this industry is data, right? And so what data are you gonna use and how are you gonna use it and, and so forth. And so those are the, the, the real quick key question. It's not using AI or not. It's like, what problem are you solving? How is AI making that solution way better than what exists? Say something maybe controversial. Um, <clears throat> VCs don't have a crystal ball. What we have is a portfolio model um, where a lot of stuff gets to be wrong when we're underwriting something. It's not because at the very early stage we necessarily believe it's durable. But what we more think is interesting is a specific problem space or a specific customer and a team's ability to iterate and be able to solve those problems. Not you have the solution right now and that's that's going to last. Um, Honestly, of the most successful investments that Founders Co-op has ever made, everyone has been a pretty large pivot, or at the very least, a small pivot. Um, like even you could call remotely a, a pivot, but that was a, a light one. From the first meeting, or even the second meeting, what makes you think someone would be able to do a successful pivot? Where do you get those signs? I think there's a lot of resilience testing that you do as an investor. So why do you care about this problem? Why do you care about being an entrepreneur? Being an entrepreneur is a hard path. What drives you to do that? What have you experienced in your life that has been you know, difficult and has 
show your resilience. And I think that that's an important thing for us to vet out in a process and to understand. And even as helpful as people are kind of on any stage of their entrepreneurial journey, thinking through that, why, why this is the right, kind of entrepreneurship is as much of a passion as it is a job. And so being passionate about what you're doing, like I say all the time, I'm like, great, you know, you can, you, we would all do this job for free, right? Like, let's be honest. And so it's, it's an interesting, um, it's it, doing something that you care about that much, I think is super, super important in entrepreneurship. <laughs> okay, okay, that's kind of interesting. Let me pivot real quick to uh, to a question that was asked before, and I want to get your guys' opinion on it, on investing in application layer and on the infrastructure layer. So how are you guys thinking about it? And then uh, I'll have some follow-up questions there too. Oh, we were just talking about this on a walk uh, right before. Uh, and look, I think what one thing I think is always important when there is a platform shift in your startup is to be really thoughtful about are you building where the platform is going or are you building on where the platform is going? That's sort of your first job. You don't want to be building where the platform's going. Like, yeah, it's like, great, like, look, you know, OpenAI doesn't have this. And you're like, they just don't have it because they haven't released it yet or haven't gotten around to it. There, there's no use. So you end up saying, okay, I just need to be really intelligent about where um, where is the market going and how do I not compete directly with the platform. But I think inside of that, this is a really un unique, I mean, maybe not unique in that it's, it's an end of one, but anytime there's a large platform shift, you and you're and you're trying to sell pick and shovels. You really don't know um, where the market is going to be. Who are going to be the users? Is it going to be people building custom things from scratch at the enterprise level? Is it going to be a whole bunch of companies that want to plug in something like a Stripe um, or some database as a service? Is that what they're looking for in the infrastructure? So I think investing in the infrastructure level is a very difficult thing to do right now, especially at a startup level. Um, I think that's why you see a lot of these huge raises because it's like you need a lot of cash and move a lot, move really quickly and make a lot of noise because um, I think the opportunities are are really threading the needle and I think that's why you're seeing people potentially being more interested about what can, you can build at the app layer perspective, but then you have the challenge of okay, is this defensible? I'll pause there because I know other people have thoughts and I don't want to say it all. Yeah, I mean, at the infrastructure level, it's it's kind of I think. All of our funds are too small to definitely, you know, invest in, in companies who could be, you know, the, the foundation models. Um, and I 100% agree with, with what Aviel had said. And I think also when you think about the application layer, if you think about the very broad use cases or the obvious broad use case, you already seen Microsoft and Adobe, you know, adding agents to PowerPoint and to all the, you know, their, their kind of you know, very broad use products. I think where the opportunities are, you know, easier to um, um, identify and also to to have a hope that they will have some differentiation over time is when you start going a little bit more vertical um, and solve a problem that, you know, OpenAI or Microsoft or Adobe or, you know, you name it, are not gonna, it's just gonna be too small for them to go solve. You know, of course, you know, if you are, you do invest in a much broader use case, that's gonna, you know, a high risk, high reward. Sounds like Sheila has invested in one of them is gonna help all of us plan our lives. And so, um, good for you, Sheila. And I, you can talk about it. I, I think um, I agree with what's been said, but my, what might be useful to add is, I think you have to understand, so, and we don't invest in the foundation model layer, like that sort of core, foundation models, but we will do foundation models within certain uh, smaller domains, yeah. right? So that, that's sort of like, as, as you think about these things today, there's so much specificity in what you're actually doing. But the only other thing to say is, uh, there's so much change happening, like the way, and we're only business software, right? So I always think about the way we work, the way we work. The way that everything works, it can shift very fundamentally. So if you're saying, hey, I can solve this in a completely different way with AI, but oh gosh, Microsoft's in that space or Amazon's in that space or whoever, fine, game on, right? Like if they're not gonna make it a core feature of Azure that's gonna be free tomorrow, that's great, right? That's sort of less good. But there is a lot, there's so much change happening that I would encourage people to not be afraid of competing. 
And I think that's super, super important right now because invention happens and then the fastness and the pace of that invention happens from all of you. And, and that's great, you'll compete, the mega caps will compete, these new foundation model players will compete, but that doesn't mean you won't win. And I think that's super, super important to both be smart about, but also to remember. So, I wanna ratify two things that have been said and then extend it a little bit. Number one, you should be building things that get better when the predictable advance of technology happens. GPT-5 will happen, bet on it, and you should have a product and a strategy that is happy about that. That's the first thing. The second thing is there is cumulatively, I, I would say probably literally, infinite opportunity at the application level. Infinite, because there's infinite work for that you know human beings can invent for ourselves. The old joke that before Excel was invented, investment bankers had to work long hours. Yeah. <laughs> we're, really, we're really good at inventing new things. What I would extend is that even though there is infinite opportunity at the application level, there is still enormous opportunity at the platform level. AWS is a great business. NVIDIA is a great business. iPhone is a great business. And in fact, as the applications change, I, I just published a blog about this the other day, as the applications change, they impose new requirements on the underlying platform. And there are those of us in this room who have application DNA and like to think about specific problems. There are those of us in this room who have platform DNA and like to think about problems in that way. And that's fine. There is huge opportunity in both those areas. So. Uh, I, I think there's great work to do across the board and we're making investments across the board. So across these, uh, let's say earlier stage investments, for lack of a better word, since seed doesn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so it's still what we use. Just say seed, just know it could mean a lot. What are you guys, what are you seeing for AI companies that what they need in order to get from the C to Series A? Is it still fundamentals or as there been some... revenue? That's my full answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would final I, answer. Regis. I would say that right now I have never seen a market that feels so unevenly distributed. Where I think for the ninety. 5% its revenue, and then for the 5%, it is purely, if you fall into the category of I am a repeat founder, or I am a well-known researcher, or some executive, or someone, I raised a seed, and now I've recruited a good team, and I'm telling a good story, and in theory, I have design customers who want to use my product, I have seen those folks raise their A prior. But that is the only exception. But if we go back, you know, three or four years ago, it was it was either story or momentum, and it would be like, wow, you hit the revenue bar. Why did you wait so long? Um, but now that's the ninety-five percent. Has the revenue bar moved? It always moves. It, it depends. <laughs> I mean, but, but I, I think. I mean, we were joking, like, you joke about this like five, 10 years ago, where it's like, well, I hit a hundred, or I hit a million in, in ARR and I'm a recurring revenue business, I deserve a Series A. Um, so like, that was never true, but I don't know, for some reason, everyone decided that was, was true. It always is like, it, it, uh, like, I think you just, when you think about revenue, it's more, there's a moment of, is this somewhat predictable and repeatable or not? And that, that is really a lot more of, of what, what matters. Yeah, I agree. I mean, is, is, it, is it ready to start scaling, really, is, is kind of the question. And, <laughs> and so, so something that I think I've been seeing across, across the board is graduation rates are going down from C to A and A to B. I don't know if they've leveled off, but has it been what do you think is needed to change that? And is that different for AI to other, to non-AI? I think more companies need to die. Like, there, there's just a lot of companies that should not have been funded and should not still be alive. Like, I had 
conversation this morning with a founder who had only raised a pre-seed and set up the call and he, he was, was a little nervous selling. I was like, I knew exactly what he was going to say in the call, which is like, you know, after our second pivot out of we've decided to return the capital. And I'm like, thank God, man. And he was nervous. And I think there's just a lot of that out there where people are not properly valuing their time and they were never going to graduate. You know how hard this is? It is hard to get from C to A. It is hard, nearly impossible to get from A to B. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a huge over, you know, kind of hangover, I think, from the zero interest post-COVID, you know, huge growth everywhere. Um, to, to, Ari, to, to Aviel's point, um, almost a year ago, I had a, a fantastic founder um, who was doing, guess what, sales and marketing tech, come and say, you know, we still have about 40% of the money we raised in the bank, you know, we should probably close and, and return the money to investors. And I was like, what are you talking about? And turned out she was she was right, um, you know. And um, they did return. I don't know. It ended up being thirty percent, thirty percent. But it was it was the right call given what was happening in that market. I'll say that it's very rational of our industry to be trying so many things, and that's going to come with high mortality. But think about the ultimate prize. You know, the ultimate prize of being an at scale player. Meta, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. You're playing an enormous galactic game. And a small chance at that is, you know, the net present value of that chance is very high. So it's very rational as an industry that we should be trying these things. And um, we have to be healthy about knowing when experiments don't work, too. What? All right. For your controversial opinions. What are the first AI companies that are going to die? I don't think we are going to answer that. I mean, let's just be honest. All right, uh, I'll reframe it. Not specific companies, but what are the general ideas or something where you're like, uh, the market's not going to go that way? I mean, I, I this is not necessarily an edu. So. I have this problem where I am a B2B investor and whatever I've done consumer, it's a mistake. So like if you're a consumer company and I give you money, you should just shut down. Um, <laughs> but when I, when I look at a lot of these, um, you know, there's so many of these companies that are trying to be this video creation, image creation, all of these different things with no differentiation. And some of them raise tons of money and I just frankly don't understand how there are so many of them and it feels like something that's just really going to be democratized the second there's a real business model around it. Someone like an open AI or some other well-funded studio is just gonna, gonna own it. So, you know, when I saw, you know, there was, I even forget the name of the company, like three companies that announced and then open AI announced Sora and then three other companies suddenly announced that they were also doing the same thing and I'm just sitting there being like, this doesn't make any sense to me. I just think, you know, we are in the first of nine innings, let's use a baseball metaphor. Who knows? I mean, there's so many great companies that will still be created that we haven't seen yet, given that what this kind of new wave of technology is enabling, that that's a more interesting question, frankly, in my mind. You know, a bunch will die, who knows which. I think the closest I'll get to a straight answer is that there are going to be companies that will die that have a lot of cash left. And I think also M&A is basically illegal in this country, but the, the Microsoft inflection deal was very innovative in this way, where, oops, all these people quit and look, they have job offers at Microsoft. <laughs> and by the way, we're licensing the IP to them. I don't know how long that, that path will exist, but I expect it to be very popular as long as it remains open. Well, and what is the, something that, that builds on that quickly is that companies are supposed to fail at all stages, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, that's good, and that doesn't mean you're not supposed to try either, but I think we just went through a period where it was just like, if you were, if you're plausible, if it's plausible that you should exist, somebody gives you money for you to stay alive. <laughs> like, and that, that was not healthy for anyone. So on 
in Seattle, Cascadia versus other markets, what are our core strength here that you guys dive into and say this is what we're good at in AI? I mean, we, I literally don't say this because we're on this campus. University of Washington is exceptional, right? And that ecosystem is really important and you know, we spend a lot of time talking to that ecosystem around what's happening, but also what people want to do. Uh, you know, which professors were like, you know, how can we do the Stanford thing where you're doing a company and a, you know, professorship and things of that nature. I'd say the mega caps that we have here are, you must mention, right? But also those mega caps have pivoted their business into AI in a fundamental way. Great, go get those experiences. Think about whether you want to go do something with that. The, the ambition level for people who understand, people often say to me, oh, I want to build a platform company, and I'm like, okay, you know, what does that mean to you? But when a Seattle person says to you, oh, I want to build a platform company, I'm like, oh, I know what that means to you, right? Because you've seen platform companies, and you've grew up, grown up with them, and you've seen our ecosystem change with them. So our talent is exceptional, and I think that we should, you know, continue to lean into it. I, I think it's unquestionable that the kind of engineering product talent here, especially for B2B and infrastructure is, you know, is just given the, the mega caps and, and all the other companies who've been here. I think where sometimes it's more challenging is in B2C, you know, remittly notwithstanding a few others. Um, and also, um, especially as you go beyond kind of that initial phase, you know, um, go to market side, sales marketing, we don't have as much talent as in, in the Bay Area. And that's, that's an area where we just, you know, need to keep growing. Keep crying. I'll just add, so again, I think I mentioned I spent a long time at Amazon. And in the course of a day, a week, month, it didn't come up that we were in Seattle or we were in Cascadia. We were on planet Earth. And I think that is a, that is a, a mindset that is extremely powerful for people who go on to do other things. That we operate on planet Earth. We build world-beating businesses. We don't, we don't build regional businesses. Um, and, and, and I see that carry through in all the kind of conversations that I have. I was, I'm kind of curious because um, at the beginning we mentioned a lot of the investments are undisclosed. And I think part of that is still trying to figure out a moat around some of this. Like, can we talk about what makes a good moat for the application layer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think why an investment gets announced, I mean, this, this is sort of maybe, so uh, like the press wants to write about a fundraise for some reason. They don't want to write about a product release or something else. And so as an early stage startup, that is your one moment or opportunity to tell your story. And so you don't want to tell the wrong story. And in fact, you want to tell that story with validation as well. And I think because things are just moving so, so, so damn fast in the space, there is a feeling for, for companies, at least the ones in my portfolio, which is if we don't need the press to find talent because we already have a strong network, if we don't need the press to find customers because we already have early design customers who are willing to work with us, there's literally no upside for us to announce the fundraise and thus that the company exists and should have a target on its back. I don't think there's much of a moat to be had in technology beyond the, the very shortest term, maybe in biotech, not in information technology, which is what I know. I think the, the best source of a moat that I know is a virtuous cycle, where being strong and being in business makes you stronger and makes your business stronger. And so uh, you don't have that in day one. In day one, all you have is hustle. And you know maybe some technology that can give you an early lead. I talk about this as unfair access to customers, unfair access to compute, unfair access to data, unfair access to talent. These are the things that can help you explode out of the gate and try to get that, that virtuous cycle going. All right, last one. Last one. All right, does anyone in the audience want to take the last question? This, this kind of 
goes to the and thank you so much. Can you stand up? Oh, hi, I'm Sam. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. This is so insightful. I have a question related to the theme, which we're talking a lot about how quickly AI is moving and how things are changing. So I'm curious <coughs> how you as investors are managing that uncertainty and that risk with such high reward, but because everything is changing and moving so rapidly, how can you kind of safeguard against future changes or uncertainties? Uh, we can't. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, on the one end, we don't want to rush and make a ton of investments on day one because we understand that we're, this is a long cycle. On the other end, we also don't want to sit on the sideline because there's great opportunities right now. So it's, um, I think in that sense, um, you know, we, it, it, it's true always when you make early stage investments. Um, and so, you, you know, you, you, I, think, I think it goes down maybe two things that have been said here. One, the, the founding team, and then the other one is, is there a virtuous cycle? As you get subtraction, you have more data, you have more, you know, you can help build on that, but you just invest. And I'm sure Sheila's got something smarter to say. Not at all, <laughs> but I, th I think part of, one thing that might be useful is I think we, we all learn all the time in those things. The amount of per, and the percentage of time, at least personally, that I have allocated to just like AI learning in the last two years, call it, is just so much higher than the percentage of time that I had allocated to kind of SaaS learning, right? And so for me, that's been a very important tool. Like I go to the academic conferences, I you know get confused by a lot of the presentations, but you, you get knowledge from all of these things. And so part of this is, as you think about the conversation originally of like, how do you tack tack when you're doing a business? Well, how do you, how are you tack tacking? But then also, how are you understanding what's coming down the pike, integrating that into what you're building? Because because a lot of it is happening in plain sight, right? The interesting thing about this sort of shift is that you do have the strength of the open source ecosystem, mega caps having to partner up with open source. And so you have a ton of visibility into what's happening. There's infinite press on AI, there's infinite reporting, there's infinite these things. But if you take that as, if you take that knowledge, spend more time on it, and then use that as sort of a piece of your power as you're building, I think that can really help you think about, okay, well, this change happened, great. Is this relevant or not? Am I building this into my product? Am I not? Am I leveraging this platform element? Am I not? But that's, that's helped me personally, at least. AI is fast, but you move fast. Yeah, well, well, it, well you're, you're nimble, I think, to, to, to I mean, use another Amazon thing, you know, focus on, you know, two-way doors rather than one-way doors in the decisions you're making. And look, the, the reality is most startups, unfortunately, succeed or fail for things out of their control. And as an early stage founder, you need to spend your time focusing on making sure that you're not, you're not scoring any own goals. You're not making any obvious mistakes. And to go back to what John was saying earlier, that's, what are the things that I know are going to stay the same, and what are the things I know that are going to change? Like that GPT-5 is going to exist and be better. And if I just focus on those things and I don't make any decisions that I can't undo, that's the best that I can possibly do in a market that moves this fast. Thank you. All right. Don't be afraid of don't be afraid of reading papers. By the way, they're written in a kind of English. <laughs> and uh, it's a, uh, you know, Hugging Face has a leaderboard of papers. Even the abstracts are pretty useful. There are other apps out there that will summarize them. You can start reading a few. I mean, maybe you're more comfortable reading these things already than I am. But for my own self, starting to read a few, I'll help you read the next few. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll go ahead and wrap up here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.